good morning. Happy Halloween, too, I guess. Um, let me just do a quick check about you. Put up your hands, one of these categories. Number one, what's a blockchain? Number two, I know a little bit. Don't get me on stage. Number three, I'm very knowledgeable. Number four, this is my world, okay? Number one, what's a blockchain? I think that's the first audience I've ever spoken where zero hands went up. Uh, I know a little bit. Okay, I'm quite knowledgeable. And this is my world. <laughs> well, I was asked, opening uh, this uh, magnificent uh, event, to talk about where we're at, honestly. And as Sebastian alluded to, um, there is a widespread view, and it doesn't just come from Gartner on the right there. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to need my slides on the screen throughout the entire uh, thing. Thanks very much. Forget the iMag. Slides look better than I do. Um, and uh, a lot of people saying, it started after the crash of crypto in 2008, that the whole blockchain thing was overhyped, and it really, uh, the blockchain revolution is kind of stalled. Now, um, guys, backstage, could you be, <laughs> please stop speaking so loudly? Um, and we can all be forgiven for having a little cognitive dissonance when we read and hear about this, and then you flip the page and you hear about some rather large organizations implementing or wanting to implement blockchain platforms, like Reliance Industries moving 300 million people on its geo platform, delivering blockchain as a service, like Facebook that would instantly through Libra, become the largest retail bank in the world by two orders of magnitude, and other large organizations like China. China is a fairly large organization adopting a fiat cryptocurrency, and the president of China, um, President Xi Jinping, saying that uh, blockchain and AI are the two big technologies for building the next generation economy in China. You study Psych 101, cognitive dissonance. It's when you hear information that conflicts. So what I'm going to do today is, uh, based on our work at the Blockchain Research Institute, we're doing 110 projects. And we're exploring hundreds of cases. Um, talk to you about where we're at, really. And I want to be frank. This is not a hype thing. Secondly, I'd like to talk to you even more frankly about some of the challenges facing us and what we need to do to move forward and um, pose a challenge to you about achieving better leadership for this transformation. So let's get into it. Number one, uh, what's a blockchain? Well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you a little history on this. I wrote a couple of books in the 1980s that nobody read. Um, I think my mother bought most of the copies, actually. And then I, f I wrote my first bestseller in 93, and that was Paradigm Shifts, a big book. And in 94, The Digital Economy, which they say was the first bestseller uh, about the web and business. And 25 years later, I was asked uh, to write the anniversary edition of The Digital Economy. And uh, I had to reflect and think upon what had occurred over the last while. And I had to go back and read the book, too. And the book held up <laughs> quite well. But I came to a conclusion that what we've had for these 40 years is really a first era of the digital age. Mainframes, mini computers, PCs, the internet, the web, social media, the mobile web, the cloud, big data. And now we're moving into a second era where technology is infusing itself into everything, physical world, soon trillions of inert objects that are smart communicating devices and also doing transactions. We have technology that does things um, that it wasn't programmed to do because it's able to learn and change. And I found myself coming to the rather, rather surprising conclusion that the foundational technology for the second era was the underlying technology behind Bitcoin, blockchain. Now, it's not the most sonorous word in the world, but I'm convinced that 
This is the operating system for the 21st century economy. And one way to think about blockchain is it's the second era of the internet. So let me explain that. For 40 years now, almost, uh, sadly I do go back with this technology that far, we've had an internet of information. But if I send you some information, or we transact or do something with information, I'm actually a PDF of this deck or an email, I'm actually sending you a copy. Even with a website, I retain the original. And that works great for information. But when it comes to things that really matter in the economy, assets, things of value like money or securities or contracts or deeds or uh, licenses or loyalty points or intellectual uh, property, other financial assets like security, stocks, bonds, swaps, you name it. Assets like the data in our identity, art, music, votes, votes and assets, something of value that belongs to somebody. When it comes to assets, sending or copying those is a terrible idea. You don't want someone copying your vote or your identity and if I send you $1,000, it's really important that I don't still have the money. Now cryptographers, for those of you in uh, category two, cryptographers for decades have called this the double spend problem. And the, there's, there has been no technology to enable us to manage assets. And the way that we handle this, in our economy, the way that we trust each other and deal with assets, um, things of value, is through middlemen. Banks, stock exchanges, credit card companies, uh, governments, now big social media companies, and they perform all the business and transaction logic for every type of commerce. They identify the asset, they clear and settle transactions, they keep records. Overall, they've done a good job, but there are growing problems. They're all based on central systems. That means that they can be hacked. There are two kinds of companies, those who have been hacked and those who will be hacked. And you can go online and it's a terrible story. And everybody from Home Depot to uh, Target to the CIA found that out the hard way. But there are other problems. I don't know if you remember where you were about 11 years ago. September uh, 16th, 2008 two days after Lehman Brothers crashed, I found myself on the stage giving the clo in Vienna giving the closing keynote to Cybos. This is 9,000 bankers. And I threw away my PowerPoint. Uh, well, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely, so that's probably not a terrible thing to do. And I gave a critique of the banking industry and how something like this could happen, but we didn't really have good solutions back then. This, these intermediaries, one subset, Wall Street, almost brought down capitalism. They also, they take too long and cost too much. Why does it take seven days for a Filipino housekeeper in San Francisco to send money to her mom in Manila? And why does she get charged by Western Union by 10 to 20 percent? Anybody ever heard of cross-border email payments? And a big problem is that they capture our data. And we create the data, but they capture it. That means we can't use this data to plan our lives. It means the data is not secure. It means that we can't monetize the data, and our privacy is being undermined. And people say to me, well, come on, Don. Pri privacy's dead. Get over it. If you've got nothing to hide, what's your problem? This is foolishness. Privacy is the foundation of freedom. And this data represents our identities, and we need to get this data and our identities back, the virtual me, so that I can manage my identity responsibly for myself. So, what if, what if there were not just an internet of information, what if there were an internet of value? Some kind of vast, global, distributed ledger where anything of value from money to stock to music to votes could be managed, stored, transacted in a secure and private way. Well, back to 2008, an anonymous person or persons named Satoshi Nakamoto wrote an extraordinary paper that cracked the double spend problem. Biggest innovation in computer science in a generation, in my mind. 
And Bitcoin today, yeah, it's a store of value. That's kind of helpful if you're in a country that has an inflation rate of 6% per week. It's a unit of exchange. You're in Venezuela, you can't get money out of the country, maybe that's helpful. But to me, and I think Bitcoin's an extraordinary technology, but to me, the real pony here is this underlying blockchain technology, because for the first time in human history, people can manage, transact, and deal with value and assets peer to peer. And trust is not achieved by a middleman, a bank or a stock exchange, or or something that's achieved by cryptography, collaboration, and some clever code, which is why my son Alex and I call it the trust protocol. This is a native digital medium for trust. Now, um, I, I was gonna give a little uh, lecture on how this technology works, and I won't, but if you go check out my TED Talk, um, there's a, a, a three minute explanation but I did want to just um, make one point. This is uh, infinitely more secure than the kind of computer systems that we have in our companies today. And uh, I had this really great analogy on why that was the case, but John Oliver on late night TV had some fun with my analogy, so I don't really use it anymore. But uh, for those of you who would like to see it, well, here we go. He did a whole we show. The way I like to think of it is that a, a blockchain is a highly processed thing, it's sort of like a chicken McNugget. And if you wanted to hatch it, you might turn the chicken McNugget back into a chicken. Now someday someone will be able to do that. And that's just going to be Hold on, that was an absolutely horrible thought. So why is that reporter so happy about the idea? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, <laughs> you can see why I don't use the analogy anymore. Anyway, so, um, so I, j this is just more positioning what this is about. So th there was a, a first big app for the Internet of Information. Do you remember? It was email. And Bitcoin was the first app of the Internet of Value. But now you have these general purpose platforms coming out, more like the web was to the Internet of Information, where you can build any um, application. So Hyperledger, um, Ethereum, the two big platforms today that, that enterprises are building business apps on. And there are others that sort of get into a gray area that's not technically a blockchain, but we're talking about distributed ledger technology. And we've got a whole set, this is just four, that I happen to think are a big deal, and yes, I've invested in the first three. But um, where this is the new operating platform, and some combination of these will emerge as being IT for the 21st century, I believe. So going forward then, um, I got lucky with this book. <laughs> I got lucky with the timing. I also got lucky with my co-author, who uh, turns out is smarter than I am. And um, it's been a joyous experience writing the book. If you want to uh, get the book, two things. Get the one with the yellow band across the top. It's a new edition, and it's got 25,000 new words about crypto assets. Um, but the very best way to get the book is in massive volume. Large numbers. Christmas is coming soon. You, I know you people have friends. Do you care about your friend? No, seriously. Um, I'm very proud of this book. So let's talk about what's actually happening. I just chose nine areas out of the dozens uh, that we're looking at at the BRI. And I'm going to whip through them and give you a frank assessment. Supply chain uh, is a big deal. This is a $50 trillion industry. And uh, 
you think about you got suppliers and trains and boats and planes and trucks and bills of lading and escrow agents and, and various sort of tax authorities and borders and, and th this stuff is moving around with, with paper and with uh, faxes and emails and primitive computer systems. Imagine if all of that was a shared network state where real time you could have a single version of the truth. This is an extraordinary thing, and supply chains will all move to blockchains, pretty much. Now, and there's some production systems that are underway today. It's just not true. They're only pilots. There's nothing in production. We are aware of hundreds of production systems, and some of them are in the supply chain area. Do you know when you go to a seafood restaurant up the street here, 25% of the fish is labeled inaccurate, inaccurately. It's either... Um, Cheap fish labeled as expensive fish, it's, it's endangered fish labeled as okay fish. So there's a big ethical side to this too. And the problem of conflict diamonds, hundreds of thousands of people have died because of that. This has pretty much been wiped out by Everledger that has a blockchain based system for knowing the provenance of a diamond. Um, Sorry, that uh, clock is not accurate, uh, I don't think. Anyway, um, number two, health. This may emerge, oddly, as being a or even the killer app for blockchain. And there are a lot of different parts to the story that we're looking at. But I'll just give you an example. Um, the University Health Network, it's one of the top 10 hospitals in the world. It's based in Toronto. And right now, there's my UHN that has your health record, you have full access to it. This is being moved now to blockchain. And after your x-ray, your radiology report will be in your patient record that you own. It's a self-sovereign record. And you can do whatever you like with it. Get a second opinion from somebody else. Send it to another hospital. You could anonymize it and sell it. You could uh, give it to science. You own your own record. And after all, the data did come from your body. It's not a crazy idea. And we're involved in, a, um, in some consortia, and HIMSS is a big one, the big healthcare management system in the US. Uh, well, it's in other countries too. To move um, patient records to a blockchain platform. Now thirdly, there, after the crash of the dot com, there were a lot of, there, there was uh, some people saying, well, you know, crypto is bad, but blockchain's still good. Or sorry, after the crash of crypto, not the dot com. Crypto bad, blockchain good. And I think that that's a false dichotomy too. Because a lot of what blockchain's about is the digitization of assets. In fact, we're going through the biggest transformation of assets from physical to digital ever. And here are just seven types of hundreds and hundreds of assets that are being digitized. We could never do this before because of the double spend problem. If you had a cute little diagram or drawing of a kitty, it was replicable because there was no internet of value. Well, now it's not, and so that thing can have some value and behave differently. So there are cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. The amazing thing about Bitcoin is that it works. Um, but there are tokens or assets that have to do with platforms. I think Ether is not fundamentally a, a currency. It's, it's an asset that enables smart contracts to work. Utility tokens. Gollum wants to replace the Amazon cloud by getting you to put your computer on their network when you're sleeping. They need a way of incenting you to do that. We have security tokens. We've seen token offerings uh, mislabeled, uh, mislabeled ICOs, initial coin offerings, because typically it's not a coin, it's being um, offered, but of hundreds of millions or more dollars where there's no investment bank, no stock exchange, no stock. But it's not just equity. All forms of securities will become tokenized. And this will disrupt, and it's already beginning to disrupt the financial industry. And I'll get to that in a sec. You have natural asset tokens. It can be like a, a barrel of oil or a, or a synthetic asset, like a carbon credit. 
And of course, we have the rise of crypto uh, fiat currencies and stable coins. Well, with, with Libra and the Central Bank of China digital economy, uh, a, di a digital currency are making a big deal. Now, this all started in the financial industry. And um, to be sure, virtually every part of the industry is in the early days of disruption. Now, if you ask what this industry does, it's actually fairly simple. It looks like some kind of weird Rube Goldberg uh, machine, you know, that, that you tap your card in a, in a Starbucks and messages go through half a dozen different companies and all this activity takes place and three days later there's a clearing and settlement and somebody gets paid. Well, Rube Goldberg, you know, invented all these complex machines that did something fairly simple. It's a pretty simple thing. I mean, if all of that were based on a distributed ledger, there would be no three-day settlement period because the payment and the settlement is the same activity. It's just a change to the ledger. So this big activity underway in payment systems, but in many other uh, areas here, it's uneven. Some areas are proving to be tough to crack because they bring about huge changes, or incumbents are, uh, are, are suffering from the innovator's dilemma that are we going to cannibalize our own business and revenue to do this? But other areas are easy. Trade finance all around the world is moving to blockchain. Right now, today, the biggest uh, supply chain in the world is One Belt, One Road, linking Hong Kong and Rotterdam. It's the new Silk Road. The trade finance on that platform is uh, being built on uh, a blockchain. And that will make a huge difference to the way that that works. And uh, I did want to say something about Libra. Lots of controversy about it. If Facebook can succeed, and that's a big if, because there are a lot of impediments. Um, there's a side to this that would be truly extraordinary. Uh, I actually wanted to write down this soundbite, that a stable coin enabling fast, inexpensive transfers of money globally could lift a billion people out of poverty and be the biggest boon to prosperity since electrification. Um, if you're not part of the global uh, uh, financial system, you're not part of the economy. And this is linked to all kinds of really big difficulties. So we'll see how this one uh, 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 plays out. Now, property rights in, in blockchain revolution, we talked about this as a huge opportunity. I know there's some companies in the room here are working in this space. And we talked about things like land titles. 70% of the land titles in the world are not enforceable and uh, in the developing world. And this is a big problem. You're in Honduras, a dictator comes to power, and he says, you may have a piece of paper that says you own your farm, but our government computer says my friend owns your farm. And it's not just dictators, it's a corrupt clerk in some little office in, in India as well. It's been bribed for $20, and all of a sudden, you, you're paying rent on your property. So a really big one that we talked about was the music industry too. These are moving slowly, I think because we're messing with some very fundamental things. We had Ujo Music from Consensus and Imogen Heap, British Grammy uh, uh, winning singer-songwriter, uh, put up the Mycela uh, uh, platform to, as a demonstration. And it's a very cool idea. The Internet of Information broke our intellectual property regime. If you were to hit song 35 years ago, you'd make $46,000 in revenue. Today, you make 35 bucks that will barely buy you a mojito in the hotel that I'm staying at. So she puts a song. It's inside a smart contract. And the song protects their intellectual property rights. You want to listen to the song, it's free. You want, you want to put the song in your movie, and the song says, well, what do you want to do? Background music, theme song, whatever. She, the way she describes it is my song acts as a business and it's out there protecting my rights. This could be huge, but this one is moving slowly. Telecom, well, Reliance uh, sure broke that one open. The largest company in India has 300 million people on its geo mobile platform and Mukesh Ambani, the chairman, says we're rolling out blockchain as a service to all these people. And I've talked to him about this. And he says, look, this is not about making money, although we're going to make lots of money. I want to solve some big problems. I want to bring people into the financial industry. I want to solve the problem of corruption. I want to solve the problem of land titles and so on. 
Uh, one of the projects that we explored was mesh networks on a blockchain platform as an alternative to 5G. And the, and the leaders of this project decided that the telcos are never actually going to implement 5G the way it's described, because they don't have the balance sheet to be able to do it. They just don't have a capital. And so this is a very, uh, rather enticing idea, and that particular project has now been released into the public domain, if you want to uh, have a look at it. Uh, we have a big problem with climate. I don't need to convince this room of that. We need to mobilize the planet to reindustrialize Earth. We've been mobilized before, but it was around world wars where we're on different sides. We need to be on the same side. How are we going to do that? More lectures about climate change? We need economic incentives for people and companies to behave differently. So at the level of corporations, we have the whole carbon credit regime. But how about for individuals? Well, uh, full disclosure, I'm involved in this company. It's called CarbonX.ca. We're tokenizing carbon credits. And you're going to buy that carbon neutral cappuccino machine because it comes with these supercharged tokens. that You can do all kinds of stuff with them, include turn them into a fiat currency. I know in the room is Ben Conte. Uh, he's the chairman, of, uh, I think, of LO3 Energy. It's an extraordinary company that is um, addressing the data challenges of a distributed power grid. And this is where we're going, of course. Power will be, become distributed and decentralized, and we need to do this. But one of the richest assets that results from this is all, kind of, all kinds of data, including um, how all, uh, from a residential point of view, how all the various appliances in your home are using power and, uh, uh, and functioning. And pretty soon a light bulb will buy power from a distributed power source and it will pay for that power and its reputation as a trustworthy device will be enhanced because it makes its payments promptly. These kinds of transactions, micro, Transactions are not going to be handled by Visa or something like that. They're going to move uh, to a blockchain. Uh, I'm going to have to speed this up. M MOOC, manufacturing. Uh, this is three years ago, I implemented an operational system on blockchain. And then the internet was supposed to transform government. Remember Al Gore, better, cheaper government in the early 90s? Does anyone here who thinks the internet has fundamentally transformed government for the better? Well, we have an opportunity to do this now, because government's not just about information. Government is about value and assets. And we have a big opportunity to strengthen um, our democratic institutions. And nation states around the world are going to move towards fiat cryptocurrencies, give central banks huge uh, power to manage an economy better, to have greater transparency, they can have a lighter touch on regulation. There are all kinds of benefits. And it turns out that blockchain, and there's some really interesting projects underway, can be very helpful, not just on the operations of government or the, or the nature of the monetary system, but on the nature of democracy itself. Because all around the world, we have a growing crisis of legitimacy of our democratic institutions. Young people aren't voting. A lot of them agree with the bumper sticker, don't vote. It only encourages them. And uh, while that may cause you to chuckle, it's not very funny because the alternatives uh, to democracy are not good. So there's some uh, interesting stuff happening around uh, uh, this as well. Ultimately, where we're going to is smart votes. That's one thing, votes inside a smart contract. I saw Michael Casey out in the uh, hall earlier. I know he's speaking here today. Um, he likes to talk about smart money. You send your kid off to university and uh, you hope that he spends um, his money on tuition and books, not in the bar. And when the kid goes into the bar, the money says, sorry, I don't do mojitos. You know, I only do tuition and books. But you could have the same thing with a vote, couldn't you? So it's uneven and combined development, but inexorably, this is moving forward. Uh, now I'm going to have to fly uh, through the rest here, but let me... Um, uh, because I've just got about 12 minutes. So let me get into the challenges. Why is this taking so long? It feels like it's taking a while, doesn't it? 
I mean, it, was, it didn't take a while from Bitcoin to go from you know, $800 to where it is today. That happened pretty fast. But when you talk about blockchain, it's revolutionary and trans, transformational power. This is taking a while. And it's not just the old saw that we tend to um, under, or, uh, overestimate the impact of technology in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. There's more to it than that. And we've been thinking about this. I think there are a few reasons that you may not have considered. The Internet of Information, it took a while, but eventually we got through the dot-com period and we got into some really big disruptive businesses, but it was, it was disrupting the information and media industries. Now, it got into some other industries, but that's fundamentally what it was about. Blockchain is about value. You're talking about the financial industry that's the foundation of any economy. You're talking about changes to the architecture of the corporation. We're talking about transformation of business processes. We're running up against a whole set of laws and regulations and jurisprudence. We're messing with very, very fundamental things here in the economy. You know what? This is going to take a while. So I'll just give you a quick example. Um, uh, actually, I don't have time to do this. Read it. It's in the book. Ronald Coase said, why do firms exist 80 years ago? And he got a Nobel Prize for answering that question. He said, the reason that we have firms and not independent contractors to do everything is transaction costs. Well, blockchain will devastate, and it's already starting to devastate all these costs. You can find things like money, ways that you couldn't find before in assets. The cost of coordination in an open market are dropping. Smart contracts are reducing the cost of contracting. So we're moving from this industrial age firm to a much more decentralized and distributed model of value creation, where we always think talent's inside. Your most precious asset goes out the elevator every night. But talent can be outside now as well. Now, Alex and I, when we wrote the book, we, we, we said, well, how far could this go? AI meets blockchain. Could you have a company with no management, no people? We called it the Decentralized Autonomous Enterprise. Um, two weeks after the book came out, coincidentally, a thing was launched called the Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And most of you know this story. It raised $164 million, a company with no people. Now, it's not a happy ending because there was a coding error in one of the smart contract facilities and they had to give the money back. But you had a company that was doing amazing things that had no people. Bob Dylan, you know, there's something going on here and you don't know what it is. So that's just a taste of the kinds of big changes that we're talking about here. How about the, the gruesome twosome? Scalability and interoperability. Aren't there just a million blockchains? Well, again, these problems are going to be solved as well. Um, it's like 1994, people used to say to me, I'm not going to use a web. It takes a minute for a, <laughs> a page to load on my screen and, there, a screen, and there's nothing there. It's the same kind of thing. The inexorable march of technology is going to um, solve these problems. Cosmos. Um, a number of people at this event from Cosmos, the in Internet of Blockchains. And now uh, a consensus has got together with, um, with Hyperledger, and they're implementing BASU, again, uh, helping to achieve uh, interoperability. I think we have an image problem, too. A lot of this is unfounded. Some of it isn't. Um, people assume that crypto is somehow connected to criminal activity. Um, which is an unfortunate and incorrect assumption. I mean, criminals are always the first to adopt an exciting new technology, um, but no, no more so than the automobile or the cell phone. And fourth, there's a big challenge of governance of blockchain. And by, when I say the word government, governance, uh, often people say, well, no, no, we don't want to govern this thing, we just want to let it happen. Well, Pindar Wong, He's got a great statement about this that he made to a, a governance group that we pulled together. He says, just because it's decentralized doesn't mean it has to be disorganized. And here we're talking about the stewardship of resources. The internet is not governed by a country or a government. It's governed by a set of networks. 
standards networks like the IETF, knowledge networks, the Internet Society, delivery networks like ICANN, policy networks like the Internet Governance Forum, advocacy networks, Electronic Frontier Foundation, and so on. We need the same thing, but with blockchain, it's more complicated because the Internet is a network of similar networks. With blockchain, we're talking about an early stage, all hundreds, thousands, actually, of, of blockchains. So each platform needs its own governance. Ethereum is governed. Bitcoin is now governed by um, an entity. But we also have governance at the application system. You didn't have that with the internet, just put up a website. But now, you'll hear later today, this is uh, Dale Crispy, who's gonna be on stage here at 4.30. I'm gonna interview him. FedEx has announced they're rebuilding the logistics industry and they can't do it by themselves. So partnering with DHL and UPS. And uh, this is an extraordinary story. Um, and we, uh, we gave these guys an Enterprise Blockchain Award uh, earlier this year because of that. And then you have the broader issue of governance of this internet of value in society. So you need things like people coming together and talking about stuff. We, uh, uh, about three and a half years ago, addressed this problem by bringing, uh, bringing people like uh, Joe Lubin and Perry Ambori and Brian Bellendorf, uh, Bellendorf from the Lennox Foundation and so on, together to try and figure out how we could move this forward. That is written up, by the way, in a report which you can get access to. Okay, I'm gonna just skip to the end here. Um, by the way, education, uh, Coursera, has now launched four full courses, we did this, um, on blockchain, 79 bucks. And people attending this conference get a big discount too. So governance is a big thing as well. Some of the extraordinary things that are happening, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance has a token taxonomy initiative to try and come up with a way of describing these tokens which can lead to standards. This is beyond Ethereum. It has to do with the industry overall. And then the final thing, uh, you can just Google this particular report. We did a blockchain census in a country. Pick Canada, it's the first one. This should be done in countries around the world. We looked at the ecosystem, how big is it, how fast is it growing, how much are people uh, getting paid. And the main impediment was the regulatory environment. Regulators lack knowledge. Um, there's a culture of hostility and enforcement. You know, it's a tough job to be a regulator because you want to get the, the balance right between protecting investors and, and consumers on the one hand and encouraging the growth of an innovation economy on the other. In most countries, this balance is wrong. And this is a big impediment. Huge problems with regulatory clarity. Um, you know, you're going to do a token offering, and the securities people say, well, that's a security. And the tax people say, no, that's, that's revenue. We're going to tax you for it. And in any country, you'll have all these competing jurisdictions. And many attempts to improve this, launch pads, sandboxes, and so on, were described as uh, quicksand. So let me just close. Um, Where's the Silicon Valley of the Internet's second era going to be? Will it be in Silicon Valley or will it be somewhere else? Um, we did a very unscientific poll during the World Cup soccer where we had a playoff. And this is, uh, it's, this is very unscientific because uh, it was done on Twitter. But this is uh, how it ended out. So let me close with this thought. Uneven and combined development, but this is happening. Uh, there are some big impediments, and to overcome these impediments, it's like the people in this room are very critical in watching this uh, online, are critical in moving this ecosystem and this community forward. It's a new paradigm, and when you get one of these, you get a crisis of leadership, L and, and leaders of the old paradigms tend to fight against change, vested interests. Um, uh, resist, and leaders of the old paradigm are often the last to embrace the new. So let's go forward. I'd like to end with an analogy for you, if I could. And um, yeah, buy the book. Um, 
At, at the, oh, the, we're gonna need to turn the volume down on that, please. At the Blockchain Research Institute, uh, we've been studying nature to try and get a better handle on distributed systems. And fish come in schools, bees come in swarms. Do you know about starlings? They come in something called a murmuration. It refers to the murmuring of the wings of the birds. It's a word in the, in the dictionary, murmuration. And starlings are out over a 25 mile radius uh, doing their starling thing, foraging for food. And at night they create one of the most spectacular things in all of nature. And the murmuration has a number of functions, but a really big one is it protects the birds from predators. You can see on the screen, the right of the screen there is a hawk, a predator of starlings, 25 times the size of a little bird being chased away by the little birds. And scientists who studied this say they've never seen an accident. There's leadership, but there's no one leader. When the moment is right, this spectacular thing occurs. So is this some kind of fanciful analogy? Or might we actually learn something from it? I think the murmuration functions according to the seven principles of the trust protocol that were inherent in what I just told you. Remember I said trust is not achieved by a middleman, it's achieved by cryptography. There, there, there's some code here for sure and that gives the birds rules. The big one is don't bump into anybody else. Uh, but there are other rules, like don't get too far away. But also, I said, trust is achieved through collaboration, which is what this is. The murmuration also has a great uh, interdependence, where the interests of an individual bird are connected to the interests of the murmuration as a whole. This is a critical concept. You know, if I'm speaking to a uh, a senior uh, business audience, I'll tell them, I don't think business can succeed in a world that's failing. We are increasingly interdependent, and the murmuration captures that. And the murmuration finally has this sort of great, uh, I would call it integrity. And that's critical because integrity is the foundation of trust. So what is trust? Trust, what is trust? It took me two months to write this sentence. Trust is the expectation that the other party will act with integrity. Trust is the expectation that the other party will do the right thing. Which is why a little bird will chase after a predator 25 times its size because it knows that the other birds will do the right thing and that they will have its back. So imagine if we connect ourselves on this planet with some kind of new network of glass and air and cryptography and code and, and agents. What could we do with that? What kinds of intractable problems facing humanity could we solve? You know, I look at this and I get a lot of, I don't know, hope really, that this new, more decentralized world that our children and grandchildren inherit might actually be a better one and that this age of distributed intelligence might be an age where the promise of digital is, um, is uh, finally uh, enabled. I'll tell you one thing for sure, the next period will not be boring, so thanks very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah.